Welcome to Type Tune Tint. I'm Tom Kranz. The bond between humans and their pets is nothing new, but in today's episode, we see such a bond evolve into a mutually agreeable business relationship. Sue Steinhardt, a career teacher, and her best buddy, Phil, are bringing messages of joy and empowerment to children through the Imperfect Phil series, children's books with Phil as the star, and a message about embracing our imperfections. Come on, here we go. No... Phil, come on. And I'm joined by Sue Steinhardt from her palatial estate in Warren County, New Jersey. Uh, we were just talking that Warren County is actually, I think, the most beautiful part of New Jersey. Most people out there in the in the hinterlands and in the real world don't think New Jersey has any beautiful parts, but it does. It and does. Sue lives out there, and I'm familiar with kind of that area, Belvedere, Knowlton Township. Sue, how are you doing today? I'm wonderful. How are you? Good. Uh, I first met Sue at a little book fair in New Providence, New Jersey, the New Providence Book Festival. Um, and I was attracted to her table by what everybody else was attracted to her table by, which was not only her children's books, but her partner in crime, a very large dog named Phil. Uh, we have lots of pictures and a little bit of video of Phil. Tell us what kind of dog Phil is and what 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 the so what do you how old is he? Where'd you get him and what is he? Phil is a Saint Bernard Mastiff mix, a Japanese Mastiff. Uh, we ended up with him. I was talking in class one day about wanting to adopt a big dog. We were looking for a Bernice or a Swiss Mountain Dog, um, something outdoorsy. And one of my students said his dog was pregnant. He lived on a farm in Hackettstown. Um, he said a St. Bernard Mastiff mix. So, of course, first thing we did was Google that. Showed my husband the pictures. And uh, he was sold right away. Um, and a couple months later, brought Phil home at eight weeks, weighing 18 pounds. And within six months, he was over 100 pounds. Yikes. He, he <laughs> dwarfed our pit bull, Molly, who's 90, and uh, now he's seven years old, and he has not had a hard life. He's we like to hear that, and you're, um, <laughs> you're an advocate of rescue dogs, correct? We are. Uh, one of the things that we try to do with every book we sell, article of clothing we sell, any speaking engagements that we have, we always donate a portion of that back to a dog rescue. So we started working with 20 Paws Rescue. That's where Molly came from. Hmm. And recently we've been working with Bully Rescue Warriors, uh, which is a local shelter um, that works specifically with pit bulls. You have a total of five children's books. Yes. Uh, each one of the theme is imperfect Phil. Uh, and we'll talk more in detail about the theme of the book and, and, and whatnot. So I met you and Phil at this book fair. And of course, um, Phil was very mellow at the time and he was, you know, an instant friend to all the kids who, who showed up. And, and that was great. Uh, tell us a little bit about your attempts to teach him to be a risk. A, I'm sorry, a therapy dog. How did that work or didn't work? I've always wanted to do therapy dog work. Um, I do a lot of volunteer work on my own um, without the dogs so it's something that I've always wanted to be a part of. And as a teacher, I thought it would be great to have the opportunity to bring him into the classroom um, because dogs just kind of have a soothing presence. So we enrolled Phil in therapy dog training school um, and he <laughs> he excelled at being Phil. He did not excel at the teacher's expectations. Um, he gets distracted and sometimes if you've never been to dog training school, people can be a little elitist um, or mm. snotty. It was just like being in any mm. other school and people would look at Phil and they would look down at him and there were Aww, really they, just, they would sit perfectly and they were, they were so pretty and Phil would lay down and he would get up and there'd be a big drool spot on the ground. Um, <laughs> and he, he, I don't know if it was that we didn't follow up with the training as much, or it just wasn't in his nature, but St. Bernard's are obstinate um, and on his last day, when he had to walk across the gymnasium and sit and get his treat, when we said, come touch, 
he made it about halfway and he laid down and he rolled over and he was just happy as could be. <laughs> and his teacher said, he's perfect just the way he is. Um, and that really became the impetus of I'm perfect. I'm perfect. And then, you know, as any good English teacher would do, I looked at the words, I'm perfect, imperfect, all the same letters, and it became imperfect Phil. And our whole process has really just been um, following this unscripted journey, asking people, what should Phil's middle name be? Friends saying you should get t-shirts. And it just has kind of unrolled itself naturally. And you do have t-shirts. You've got merch which I saw. We have your, merch. Yeah. You got the stuff, man. That's really great. We have so, no shame. We'll put his face on anything. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, hey, it's a beautiful face. Why not? Right. So um, you mentioned that you're a teacher. Tell us a little bit about your life as a teacher. You were an mm -hmm. English teacher for a very long time. Uh, where and when and why? Sure. My husband and I are both teachers. He retired from Warren Hills in 2019, right before the pandemic. So he never had the joy of teaching virtually. Oh boy! Yeah. I started in my career um, at Warren Hills, which is where my grandfather taught for 40 years hmm. and then uh, moved around a little bit, got involved with a fantastic program at Roxbury High School called Sister Schools for Peace where we had the opportunity to travel with students uh, to Australia and live and work with families in Australia, and then ended up at Mount Olive High School in 2001, um, and then retired from there in 2022. <laughs> I've forgotten already. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so 20 years yeah. and I, I coached, coached field hockey, basketball, softball, various sports. Um, I was involved with a number of different activities and clubs that uh, were available to the kids and loved it. I spent the last 15 years teaching uh, seniors. Hmm. And I think every teacher finds their, their niche. Um, some people love freshmen. Some people love middle school. Seniors were the perfect place for me. And in my last year, I had the opportunity um, not just to teach the regular curriculum, but we offered a number of electives. So I got to teach uh, African-American literature, women in literature, and rock and roll as literature, uh, which wow. is an amazing class. So just really enjoyed my time. I had the perfect last year, perfect group of kids, beautiful last day of school, walked off the graduation field, Handed my keys to the principal, said, see ya. When did you decide that you could write children's books based on your dog? I always wanted to write. Um, I think I've, I've always written um, poetry, journals. I've just always wanted to write. And I never had that voice. Um, I never had that character. And like you said, at our booth, um, no one wants to buy a book about me. <laughs> no one wants to read a story about me. And when we adopted Phil, and uh, he's just he's just funny. He just makes people happy. And I know everyone thinks their dog is the best. Um, and everyone's dog is the best. But Phil just makes people happy. And he became that character. Mm. He became the voice that I was looking for. Um, and through through teaching, you you see the struggles that the kids have and you, you know, you hear their conversations and um, it, it's hard to be a kid. It's hard to be a teenager. And Phil just became this voice that I could take what I was seeing him do and I could make it into a story, right? All good teachers are storytellers. Hmm. Um, and we were out walking and Phil, he found a stick that he was trying to, to pull out of the woods. And it turns out the stick was actually a vine. Um, but as a, as a teacher, I'm looking at this and thinking, okay, what's he doing? He's pulling, he's pulling, he's pulling. It's, he's not getting there, you know? So, so what's the lesson? What's the lesson about pulling on something that maybe isn't practical? You know, what's the lesson in some of the different behaviors that he has? So in everything that he does, I was just finding these stories and that became instead of a novel that I thought I was going to write became the children's books, you know, by observing what he does and thinking about what, the, what's the inherent lesson we ended up with stories. I count five books. Uh, Philip T. Basher is imperfect. Phil was the first one, right? Yeah. And that was when uh, Phil had uh, this, this lengthy Philip T. Basher identity. And then 
Imperfect Phil is who I am. Imperfect Phil is a friend. Imperfect Phil is happy. Imperfect Phil is kind. And, you know, the whole theme, I, I actually read two of the books uh, before this interview, and the themes are very much about very basic kid kid stuff, right? Yeah. Um, who uh, Imperfect Phil is a friend, and that book talks about how Phil – makes friends with, I think, Dixie the dog, right? The new dog in the neighborhood. Yes. He that she's by herself and she doesn't know how to do anything. And then he kind of reaches out to her and, you know, it, it. you relate, you know, through your narrative, you know, have you ever been in a new place? You talk to the kid who's reading, have you ever, has this ever happened to you? And I can see that's a really great way to bring, to bring kids into the, into the fold. And I noticed also that you do these readings. So did you, is that something that you're doing now? You read to kids in school environments? We do. Uh, like I said, it, it has unfolded naturally. Someone asked us at a, at a vendor fair, if we did school groups and I thought I'm a teacher, I can do a school group. So we've actually had the opportunity now to get into elementary schools and it's been fantastic. Um, I developed a curriculum based on all of his books using all the New Jersey state standards. Um, nice. So we have um, lesson plans that go with all of his books. So we do a number of different things. We can go in, um, we read Jessica, who is our illustrator. She made coloring book pages. So we take coloring book pages and some of the younger grades, they do coloring. And while the groups are coloring, everyone gets an opportunity to come up and see Phil. I do word searches. We have mazes, um, homophones, sentence completions, um, I am poems. So everything based on his books. And then with the older grades, the sixth, seventh, and eighth graders, uh, we do story writing. Um, I do Mad Libs with them. So they're they're learning their parts of speech. They're looking at how to tell a story. And it's just been great. And as we get into more and more schools and I discover what we need, you know, as a teacher, you're a storyteller. You bring him to all these reading on all these school events, right? Yes. So, and I'm guessing that from a purely, you know, entrepreneurial point of view, uh, this has been a help to book sales. Yes. Yes. We, um, we offer the books at a discounted price whenever we do school groups. Um, and then we get a lot of our bookings from the different vendor events that we do. Um, and again, it evolved naturally. People asked if we did the school group. So we made up brochures, business cards, um, just to kind of promote what we do and sort of, you know, get our name out there. When we come back from my upcoming commercial break here at which I shamelessly promote my own book, <laughs> uh, I want to talk a little bit more about your writing process Talk a little bit about your illustrator, a young woman who you met at when she was a student of yours, as I understand. So folks, don't go away. I'll be right back with Sue Steinhardt after this moment of shameless self-promotion. The world is a big, scary place, and it is hard to make it alone. So don't. Ask for help. Ask for a hand. Reach out a paw. Be a friend. I am a dog. I love life. And I have flaws. I'm perfect, imperfect, just like you. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the theme of the Imperfect Phil series of children's books, written by my guest today, Sue Steinhardt. Uh, you know, when I looked at all your books at the table at New Providence, I said, wow, that's that's like a lot of work. Uh, and you have a publisher, so you've got help in doing that. I self-publish, so I kind of do everything myself. But there's still a lot of DIY involved. Um, and you have an illustrator who has worked with you on all these books here. I got to tell you folks, the illustrations are amazing. I mean, they make half the book. The story is great, yeah. but the pictures are fantastic. And, and you know, the drawing by this young woman is great. Tell me a little bit about, um, how you actually write. I guess I've asked this to other children's authors as well. Do you write the story first and then get the illustrations or are the drawings done first and then you write to them or how does, how does that work for you? 
it starts, like I said, with observing, um, seeing what, what Phil does, seeing where that lesson is. Um, <laughs> one day he was walking around and he had um, a produce sticker stuck to his tail. And it just made me think of that time where you put your shirt on inside out because you're you're just tired and you go to work and no one tells you your shirt's on inside out. You know, so it becomes a story. And then you just think about what's the lesson there. Um, so it's it's about observation, I think, is the first part. The second part is figuring out, um, asking the questions, what conversations do parents need to have with their kids? What are kids afraid of? What are they thinking of? So when you ask those questions, they're conversation starters, you know, and I think that's a big part of what we wanted to accomplish in our books. And there, it's hard when I was trying to find um, a publisher, they're not picture books, they're not YA books, they're somewhere in the middle. And when people ask me what age group they're for, I say they're really for anyone. Um, a third grader can read them by themselves, but it's about sitting down with your child and having the conversations. Um, so they are simple. Um, but they delve into topics that everyone needs to discuss. And I think we should start our own genre um, of children's nonfiction because all of Phil's stories are true. So we write the stories. I sit down with Jean and Brenda um, and they help me with the editing and we decide, you know, word choice is the, is the message there, is the moral there. And then I send the pages to Jess and she does pencil sketches. So like you said, um, the artwork is, is my favorite part. It, it makes the story. And I think so many books today have um, AI generated illustrations, mm -hmm. computer generated illustrations. Jessica does every picture by hand pencil sketch. So then she'll send me pictures of um, the pencil sketches, you know, we like it, we don't like it, let's shift this. And a lot of times I'll just give her suggestions, you know, maybe put, um, you know, a dialogue box in the background, maybe add some stars here, add some ribbons here. And she does all that, we approve that. Then she does um, watercolors. So all of the illustrations are done by watercolor. And she takes over from that point. She scans all of her artwork and sends it on to um, our publisher, Brenda, and then they take the process from there. Great. And when you actually write, do you do, I mean, do you sit down when it's, all right, I'm going to put my story down right now. I'm going to start. Do you actually, uh, do you set aside a certain time of day to do that? Do you do it? You know, do you bark things into your phone while you're dressed, stopped at a red light? Do you sit at night in a dark room? Or how, what physically do you do? I have two places of inspiration. One is when I'm out walking the dog and I'm watching and I'm thinking and I'm playing it all through my head. And two is in the shower. I come up with the best ideas in the shower, whether it was a lesson plan for class, whether it's how to save the world. Um in the shower and out for a walk. So I usually will play it over in my head. And then I have a template on my computer that has the pages. It's just a very rudimentary um, table. It has all the boxes and I will write out the story in there and then just try to simplify it. So there's maybe only a sentence or two on each page. And a lot of my stories started off as longer blogs. If you go to his website, a lot of his stories started off as full length blog entries, and then we broke them down into children's books. Cool. That's uh, quite a process. And how long would you say it takes you to do one book from beginning to end? The writing process for me is probably the easiest part um, because once I see the story, then it's just a matter of putting it down. So that part probably takes um, maybe two days to a week. Um, once we have that and I meet with Brenda and Jean, we'll probably meet twice for about two hours. Brenda and Jean are with your pub or your editor. They're the publishers publisher. and editors. Okay. Yep. Yep. So I'll meet with them. It takes about an hour or two to go through. And then Jess will take about two to three weeks. So we started the first book when she was still in college. Uh, so she was working around her own classwork, exams, things like that. So it takes her about two or three weeks to get the artwork done. Um, and then once we send everything up, I would say from start to finish, it's probably about a two-month process. 
Okay. And tell us a little bit about uh, your illustrator, her name and when you met and how you, I mean, you guys obviously work really well together because these books are fantastic. I met, first I met Jess's sister, Nikki. She was a student in my class at Mount Olive, um, had a great relationship with her. And then I met Jess. She was in my senior honors class and she would whip up posters. Everyone wanted that, her to be in their group because when they had poster assignments, she would just make these amazing illustrations. Um, I went to see one of her soccer games one day and Jess is a tiny little person and she was fierce on the soccer field. And my <laughs> husband and I were watching and I said, oh my gosh, she was knocking people over left and right. And it was just something about her energy. Um, it, it was spoke to me. And I asked her in class one day, um, if I write these books, would you do the illustrations? And she said, sure. Uh, so mm. we started when she was in my class. And it was interesting because, you know, you want to do right by everyone. So we sat down, her dad came in, made up a contract. Um, we both signed it. And y- you have to make that transition from teacher student to a place where, you know, she needs to be able to speak to me as her coworker, sure. And she it's like a business it's relationship, advocate. really. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think it's been a seamless transition. She's got a super supportive family. Um, and we've just really been able to make that transition from teacher student to um, business people that work together. And Jess always has the first option whenever we do a book to say, you know, yes, she's going to do the illustrations or no. Um, and it's just, it's really been a great relationship, um, watching her kind of develop her own career. Mm. Um, you know, as she graduated from Savannah college of art and design, we went to one of her art shows the other day and, you know, I think it's great for everyone because now she's also building, you know, her resume and her portfolio. She can say she has five published books. It must be really cool to see a former student blossom like that over, you know, a few years. That's you know, it's kind of inspiring, you know, another inspiring. One of the best parts about teaching. Yeah, I bet. I bet. Um, All right. So back to this large, this large animal who shares space with you. Uh, (laughs) How old did you say Phil was now? Phil is seven. So, and he's a cross between a St. Bernard and a Mastiff, two very large dogs. So I got to believe that Phil eats a lot. He poops a lot. (laughs) <laughs> and he drools a lot, right? So, like, are you going broke feeding him, or what? What? What the hell do you feed Phil anyway? <laughs> so Molly actually eats voraciously as much as as Phil does. The hard part is our vet keeps telling us that Molly's overweight and Phil is underweight. So the bag <laughs> says <clears throat> Phil should eat anywhere between six and seven cups of food a day. Um, And that's just become normal to me until I was at a friend's house and I saw that they fed their dog a quarter cup of food. I Um, feed mine uh, one cup in the morning and one in the (laughs) evening for both of them. And they're like, (laughs) that seems cool for them. Six or seven a day. Six or seven plus. And he's underweight. And he's underweight. Yeah. Plus he either gets a can of food or a bag of um, chicken strips, unflavored chicken strips each day. Wow. And I don't know. My husband says that maybe we have a codependent relationship, um, but Phil doesn't finish his food until I sit on the floor with him and hold his bowl. And then he'll finish his food at night before we go to bed. Did you do any kind of workshops or classes on how to write a children's book? I asked this because I've, I've, I've interviewed a couple other children's book authors and one or two of them specifically did like kind of an online workshop on how to write children's books. Did you do any of that or did you just kind of go from the gut? I didn't do any of that. Um, okay. Like I said, it's just, it's rolled itself out. Um, I observed, I wanted to write it down. I talked to my friends. I call my friends, my board of directors. Um, whenever we get together for dinner, if I have a question, I'll say, okay, informal meeting. Um, and it's really just been on suggestions, you know, what, what people say, you know, a good children's book should do this, a good children's book should do that. And seeing what kids need, the conversations that they need to have. 
the best children's books that I've seen, and they're all among the authors I've I've interviewed, they all have a very specific message. They all have a very specific conversation to have with the kids. Like each one of the imperfect Phil books, one's about you know friendship, one's about what it means to be happy, what it means to be kind, what it means to be alone in the world. I'm really impressed with your industry, your industrious nature, and your entrepreneurship, <laughs> and you know just kind of the vision you have here. Are you going to continue writing these books, or or what? What's, what's ahead for you here? That's a great question. Um, <laughs> I plan to write one book and then my mom said, you should have a second book. So I wrote a second book and then my mom said, you should have a third book. <laughs> and I wrote a third book and my mom said, I think there's a fourth one. And then um, there was, oh, I think there should be a fifth one. So now we have five. Um, I am really enjoying the opportunity to get into schools, to re-engage mm-hmm. with, with kids because um, I miss that. And I would like to kind of pursue that more. I would like to try to expand my opportunities to go and to speak to other teachers and to to be that motivational speaker, um, because I feel like our story has really no pretenses. Um, we don't claim to be anything that we're not. And I, I like to remind people of just sort of simplifying and remembering why they got into it. And then, of course, our ideal um, scenario is that Pixar or Disney call mm. and say they would love to make a story about Phil. And I said to my husband last night, I said, you know, I don't think they're going to just call out of the blue. I said, maybe we need to um, start our own screenplay. So I think in the back of my head on my next walk or when I'm in the shower, I'll start scripting that screenplay and see if we can't make that come to fruition. Oh, good for you. I I've tried writing a screenplay and it's so much different than just writing. I have no idea how to do it. It's so much because you have to think in terms of scenes, right? Yes. Here's a scene and here's what it's going to look like. And you, you know, it's not just, you know, just kind of writing lovely words. Um, Right. So uh, if people want to reach out to you, uh, like, for example, if they're interested in having you come and do reading or do your curriculum, how, what's the best way to get in touch with you? So we have imperfectphil.com is our website. And then imperfectphil at gmail.com is our email. Uh, so either one of those work and we get back to people right away. And we would love the opportunity to spread our word. And your books are also available on that website, but also on Amazon, correct? They are available on Amazon and they're available on Etsy. And if you order them off Etsy, they come directly from my basement. We can personalize them. We can sign them. And then we have a few events coming up that are also listed on our website where you can meet Phil in person. Imperfectphil.com. There it is. It's up on the screen for those of you watching video. And uh, Sue, it's been really a pleasure meeting you. I wish you all you know, all the success, uh, that you deserve and you deserve a lot because you're, you're a hard worker here. And it's, it's really great to be able to repurpose a career into something that you really love doing. And that's, that's what you're doing. Sue Steinhardt. Thank you so much. Uh, and good luck. Thank you so much.